This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 914, recorded on June 30th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York... Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Well, that's it for June, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Right? This drops Ju- July 2nd, right? Is that? Wow. July 1st, 2nd. You're right. That's yeah. Saturday. 30 that's days cr- has September, April, June, and November. <laughs> and I always say once June is over, it's really it for the summer. Before you know it, it's September. So just very briefly, what do you see? Uh, in the summer as far as COVID goes? Do you think the numbers are going to stay low or what? Um, you know, it, it's really hard, as I think we've said, to to know exactly what the numbers are. I mean, there's SARS-CoV-2 everywhere, and we've got all these people getting together. And so, um, you know, th- there's lots of virus. I don't think we're going to have as low um, a number of infections um, this summer. Um, but I still am optimistic that we're continuing to see low levels of hospitalizations and deaths over the summer. So, you know, some mixed, mixed optimism there. But let's get into it. Uh, the quotation The fishermen know that the sea is dangerous and the storm terrible, but they have never found these dangers sufficient reason for remaining ashore. And that's Vincent Van Gogh, I think, right? It's hard to know these days with quotations. The other Vincent. (laughs) The other, yeah, the other Vincent. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I think part of this is for our listeners, and we probably have a number of these listeners that are still, um, you know, shuttered at home wearing N95s when they drive around by themselves in the car. And I, um, hopefully we're going to be uh, talking a little bit about, um, you know, making making decisions, like going, going back um, to, uh, you know, entering, engaging in different social activities. Um, but I am going to, um, you know, talk a little bit about... Um, you know, significant risk factors, right? Because as, you know, as many of us are excited to go forward, there still are, um, you know, a, a number of individuals that are still ending up in the hospital, right? We're still at that level. I was looking at the New York Times tracker about 300 COVID deaths a day, about 2,000 a week, about 100,000 plus a year. I mean, that, that's still kind of crazy that that, you know, is in our minds as like, you know, suitable, acceptable goal. Um, And that's at current levels. Like, forget about the fact that we're going to have a fall and winter when we all get together for the holidays again. Um, But what are the big um, factors? And it's really interesting if you look at the hospitalizations, the biggest uh, risk factor that really stands out if you go to the New York Times tracker, and we'll put a link into this, is really age. People being over the age of 65, there's really a, a separation there. So, being over the age of 65, being unvaccinated, that's really a, a different population. So, um, you know, talk to your doctor about, you know, what are your individual risks and um, how can you mitigate those? And we always try to keep, um, you know, up on what those measures are. Um, the other challenge, and this is going to lead into the uh, the boosters for the fall discussion, is keeping track of uh, all the variants, right? Um, and so, you know, we'll put a link into this covid.cdc.gov uh, variant trackers. Um, but basically, we're seeing that BA.5 and BA.4 are really uh, taking over, and particularly BA.5 seems to be, you know, if you're following the horse race, seems to be winning. Um, but this actually came up in some of the discussions. Um, so I'm going to talk right here in the front about, you know, what happened this week, Tuesday, June 28th, the FDA's Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee met, and the panel came down 19 to 2, we'll talk about those two, in favor of redesigning booster shots to also target Omicron or its subvariants rather than simply the original version of the virus, and panelists cautions that the recommendation doesn't necessarily mean everyone should get a tweaked booster. Um, This might only be for um, older adults, those at high risk of the virus. Um, And I want to sort of temper this with a quotation from Dr. Um, Kanto Subareo. Subaro. uh, Subaro. Yep. Awesome. It's good to have you here for the pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> she chairs the, uh, uh, this, this position chairs the WHO um, committee. 
Um, and they're a virologist. So, uh, you know, they're in the stable with you, Vincent. Um, we don't want the world to lose confidence in vaccines that are currently available. Um, so I did just want to, I'm going to pull you in a little bit on this, Vincent. You, you, I, I know we're going to do a deeper dive next week. I'll sort of promise everyone that. I think maybe Paul Offit's going to come for a visit. But did you have any thoughts right off here? Well, I, th I think that um, the data saying that we need a, um, a variant-specific booster are scant. And if you look at some of the quotes from the committee members in the press, they're not really sure that it's going to make much of a difference. Um, you know, and Paul Offit, who's, uh, in my opinion, one of the best vaccinologists out there, he's usually very bullish on vaccines in general, but he doesn't see the need. And part of the problem is all we know is that when you give people the Omicron based vaccine, and remember, it's it's the original Omicron. It's not any. It's not BA four or five, and which who is knows, a big issue. Yeah, which is a big issue. And who knows what's going to be around uh, in the fall? So um, the the all we know is that they induce neutralizing antibodies. We have no idea of how these uh, redesigned vaccines uh, would would go in terms of disease. So we, and in fact, one of the panel members said, you know, they're asking us to have a crystal ball, and we just don't know. So I think they're all acting on the side of caution. But there's a really not, it's not like for influenza where we know, oh, yes, the neutralization titers have dropped below this number. It's, it, that means there's going to be more disease. We don't know that. So it depends where you stand, whether you want to be cautious or whether you want to be driven by the data. And I agree with Paul Offit, the data just aren't there. Yeah. And I think also, you know, to sort of, you know, reinforce what the discussion was is that the original vaccines continue to do really well at what we, you know, what we want vaccines to do, which is keep people from dying, keep people out of the hospital. Um, yeah, these new updated vaccines, like maybe a twofold higher level of these neutralizing antibodies, uh, which is really the difference between Pfizer and Moderna. So, you know, should we have just said everyone now gets Moderna? I, it's really hard mm. to hard to know. And I, I think, you know, as they were very honest, we're, we're starting down a new road. You know, there, there's sort of this idea that maybe every fall we'll be trying to somehow update the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines to keep um, updated with the, with the variants that are predicted to emerge. And we, we don't have the same infrastructure we have had with influenza to try to do that. We all know how well we do with influenza. So yeah, we're entering a brave new world and a, a deeper dive. Um, but it is interesting because now we're seeing um, a lot of folks saying, well, boy, maybe I don't want to get that next shot. Maybe mm. I want to wait for the fall. So we'll, we'll see, you know, significant impacts, but sort of promise our listeners um, expect uh, next weekend, uh, a couple episodes to drop with a deeper dive into a booster discussion. Daniel, can I ask you? Um, yeah. One of the, if you look at some of the data slides that were presented at the advisory meeting, uh, they look at one of the metrics is hospitalization, uh, you know, after COVID infection of vaccinated people. And, um, you know, I think that's a flimsy metric. I would rather see ICU admission or death, but we don't have either. And I think the point is there are very few deaths in vaccinated people. So statistically, that would be difficult. But in terms of hospitalization, is it is it a concern that hospitals would be overburdened and therefore, is this one of the things they're thinking about? Okay, if we give them a variant-specific vaccines, we'll cut down on hospitalizations for six months. So yes, so yeah, and I think that's a really good point. Um, you know, understanding the disease, there's even a distinction between why are you being hospitalized for COVID-19? Are you being hospitalized because it's the first week and you're just an older individual and you just can't handle mm -hmm. this at home? You know, you can't keep up with the oral intake. That's quite a bit different, quite a bit different as far as resources than, you know, what we saw early on of people getting admitted during week two, that early inflammatory requiring significant pulmonary support, the staffing required to keep someone like that alive. Um, but that actually is part of the calculation and part of the calculation for timing of boosters in the fall, whether it's the original, whether it's an updated, is we do want to reduce the strain on the, the healthcare system, on the hospitals. Um, you know, the hospitals are not there to take care of COVID-19 patients. They're there to do other things. Um, you know, the administrators might think they're there to make big profits off, you know, elective surgery, I hate to say. But um, we need to keep in mind, um, you know, the fact that if we overwhelm the healthcare system, mortality goes up and it doesn't need to go up. It just goes up because we can't handle those volumes. Okay. So, yeah, no, these are all important. It's a complex subject, uh, but we do have, say, some really, you know, 
bright people really trying to do the, the best thing by us all. So, all right, children and COVID-19 vaccines. Um, this is really a big thing lately, right? And I, and I do think there's a, there's a reasonable discussion going on here, you know, and, and a lot of parents are asking this question, you know, boy, it, it took you long enough to get those vaccines out. My child's already been infected. So, you know, what's the point? Um, you know, what's the point of vaccinating my child after they've already gotten SARS-CoV-2? Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, these studies. So uh, the first paper, um, and actually it's going to be two papers, both published in the Journal of Pediatric Infectious Disease Society. The first is Pediatric SARS-CoV-2, Zero Prevalence in Arkansas Over the First Year of the COVID-19 Pandemic. And the second is Antibody Responses to SARS-CoV-2 in Children um, with COVID-19. So both were accepted, um, you know, a number of months ago, um, but are just coming out now in the June edition of the journal. So I got a chance to really um, look through them and they're fully um, you know, peer-reviewed, uh, post-editing. Um, and I do think they address a number of topics that have been coming up um, as pediatricians and other providers discuss vaccination with parents of young children. So just sort of bullet point a couple of these. Um, you know, one, where, you know, and this, as I brought up, you know, we're were most children already infected? You know, if children are mostly all infected, what's the what's the benefit of a vaccination? after a child's already been infected. So that's one thing that comes up. Um, and in this same line, um, is, does an infection give a good immune response in young children? Um, and so the Arkansas Serial Sur Survey is now dated, but in the second study, the authors found that in children 18 years old and younger, that the four and under had the highest antibody responses to infection, um, and that this lasted for months. So I actually think these are reasonable um, questions, reasonable discussions to have. We actually saw, right, in the children zero to four months that they actually got a pretty good response to vaccines as well. Um, but this is a little bit of a challenge, right, as we're having these discussions. It's one thing to jump in there with a child who's never had SARS-CoV-2 and say, let's get them vaccinated before they have that first exposure. Um, but there's a lot of unknowns. If a child's already had SARS-CoV-2, they did however they did. Um, so, you know, I, I think that this is going to be a vaccine and we're clearly seeing where parents are having um, discussions with those pediatricians. Um, and, and I think that's appropriate. A lot of people are not rushing out. A lot of people are not going to those um, those pharmacies and mass vaccination sites. They want to sit down. They want to have that discussion with the pediatrician. There's certain parents that are, are jumping ahead um, that are saying, hey, you know, my child, it's a no brainer. I want to get them vaccinated. Um, there's other parents who are saying you know, sort of about wait and see. Um, but just to give people sort of a landscape of what's happening in the pediatric uh, vaccine arena. Daniel, uh, right. this this table you have here of <laughs> the different vaccines, um, I noticed that the Moderna has a magenta label and a purple label. <laughs> seems to me that would be tough to distinguish, wouldn't it? <laughs> so, yeah. So so now, and this is a bit of a, a correction, uh, something I, uh, you know, the keeping straight the vaccine schedules and and we'll put this in our show notes, a link to it, but keeping straight, um, what age, what vaccine, what color cap? Um, yeah. It, it, what, what is, I mean, I know what purple is. I'm not sure I know what magenta is. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, I'm, Vince and I will go through this just a little bit. So, you know, different products have different age ranges on, you know, different caps and different sizes. So, uh, we'll start off with the Moderna, uh, just to get everyone up to speed on the, the accurate. So, you know, Moderna, and this is pretty straightforward, I talked about last time, is in the six months to five years of age, uh, you're going to be using the blue vial cap with magenta bordered label. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and for most people, that's going to be dose one. And then at least four to eight weeks later, you get dose two. We've talked a little bit about extending that um, range out a little bit. Um, and then those who are moderately or severely immune compromised, um, you're actually getting dose one, at least four weeks later, dose two, at least four weeks later, dose 
three. And even though right now for most people, this is two doses, we're expecting that there'll be a recommendation at some point for, you know, boosters, um, third shot, et cetera. We'll see. Um, I'm going to stay in the same age range and go, you know, roughly the same age range to the Pfizer BioNTech. This is a maroon vial cap with maroon bordered label. And this is six months through four years. Um, and this is a little bit different than the other Pfizer schedules we're um, familiar with. And so you get dose one, and then at least three to, week, three to eight weeks later, you get dose two, and then at least eight weeks later, you get dose three. Three. So a correction, it's not five months for that third dose. It's only um, at least eight weeks. So you really could get dose one, three weeks later, get dose two, eight weeks later, get dose three. So you, you could get it in in 11 weeks. Um, so, um, and then the rest of the Pfizer's is that at least five months. So it's a pretty complicated table. Um, you have to stick this up in, in the clinic. Um, what I think a lot of um, pediatrician offices will do is they'll just pick one product to sort of keep everything straight. Um, but there is an advantage, actually, I'm going to say, to having both um, options, right? Um, the Moderna, I like the, um, the six months through five years, the ability to one dose, second dose, and then you're done, um, probably for the time being. Um, Pfizer has the advantage, even though it's three doses, we saw less fever, less reactogenicity. So certain settings where a pediatrician may want to make that recommendation. So um, I think um, it's good that we have options here. And I, I put in the, the, the small print, but I actually made it bigger. Um, and I'm just going to run through that for, for everybody. So, you know, those individuals thinking about um, their children getting vaccinated, um, the current recommendation is to complete the primary series with the same product. Um, there is this comment um, about, you know, potentially delaying a primary series. Um, and we talked a little bit about uh, whether that's an eight week delay or whether or not you're going to delay a little bit longer, maybe out to three months. And again, that's a challenge during a time when we're seeing so much infection. I was just on a recent call where um, if you delay three months, then you're the doc who has to answer the, you know, the, the phone call with, you know, uh, so-and-so just got infected at two months. They didn't make it to three. Why'd you tell us to wait? Um, you know, that's just going to happen. Um, but then I think the big thing I wanted to point out here is that recommendation of an eight-week interval may be optimal for people who are not moderately or severely immunocompromised um, in that age is six months to 64 years, particularly for those males age 12 to 39. So there might be some advantage to waiting a little bit longer. Um, and that actually may, in a large part, be why we're now, you know, recommending across the board that third dose because we gave that first two so close, that prime prime, not really a prime boost like we initially had hoped. Now, Daniel, the recommendation for three months from symptom onset, if you had previously SARS-CoV-2, is that different from adults? No, it's it's kind of across the board. And it's this idea, again, as we've sort of talked about the the basic immunology that, you know, if you can wait that three months, if you don't get infected during three months, maybe you're going to get, you know, a better boost. You know, we're starting to, um, you know, acknowledge, recognize, and we, I don't really mean we, I mean, you know, the, the authority figures that be, that getting an infection actually does um, have some impact on our, you know, immunology, <laughs> on our protection, um, on our ability to respond to future infections. So this is sort of that idea of starting to think about that infection as somewhat of a boost and then getting your next boost three months later. All right. So it is the time of camps and schools, and the letters have already started going out. And people probably know that I, um, I give advice, I give guidance to a number of these camps. Um, you know, I've been doing it for, for free for a while, actually. I didn't realize that camps were so profitable, I, you know. I have to rethink <laughs> my pro bono work. Um, maybe I'll start charging, <laughs> or maybe I'll encourage them to, you know, donate to Parasites Without Borders. Um, <laughs> but uh, let, let me sort of bring people up to state, uh, up to uh, the current state of things. And I'm going to mention the CDC guidelines. I'm actually going to say here in New York, New York State is right in accord. So you might have some slightly different variation um, depending on, you know, what state you're in. Um, but the CDC guidelines are really. Um, they, they really split depending upon whether um, an individual is up to date or not with their COVID-19 vaccines, right? So this means um, not only that primary series, but, you know, if you're supposed to get that third or that fourth shot, um, that's required to be up to date. So if you're up to date um, and there's been an exposure, 
then um, the, the campers, the children, the adults, anyone involved does not need to quarantine unless they develop symptoms. Um, even if they don't develop symptoms, a uh, recommendation to get tested at least five days after the last close contact, watch for symptoms for 10 days. I mean, we're always watching for symptoms, right? So, um, but if you do get symptoms, you want to isolate immediately. Um, you want to find out if that's COVID or not. Um, and then you're going to sort of go ahead with precautions and isolation for the infected. But if you are not up to date, and this is sort of a problem, this is sort of the stick part of the guidance, um, then that child must be pulled out of that setting. They must quarantine for at least five days from exposure, must wear a well-fitting mask when around others. And then um, again, even if they don't have symptoms, you want to get that test at day five. Um, and it sort of goes on. But there's really this bifurcation here um, on whether or not the children are up to date. So this was sort of our encouraging everyone just get up to date so that we don't have to worry as much about quarantines so that we can move forward because, boy, you know, missing five days, missing a week of camp is really tough for these kids who are finally, you know, out there trying to enjoy their summers. All right. And I like to echo, use those tests intelligently. Remember, if it doesn't make sense, um, you know, go ahead, get another, get another test. Um, but I'm going to jump into active vaccination and just a little a couple articles here we'll talk about. Uh, really just keep reinforcing our guidance here. We have another article addressing the increased risk of death for COVID-19 infection during pregnancy. Um, and the article all cause maternal mortality in the U.S. before versus during the COVID-19 pandemic. This was published in JAMA Network Open. In the U.S., maternal deaths increased 33.3% after March 2020, corresponding to the COVID-19 onset. Um, and this is higher than the 22% per, overall excess death estimate associated with the pandemic. So this is a particularly high risk um, population. So, you know, those, those um, fertility specialists, those, um, you know, people out there who are encouraging um, women to wait until after, um, that's not good advice. Um, it's not good advice for the mother. It's not good advice for the unborn child. It's not good advice for the child who will be born without that passive protection. All right. This is a question that I know um, has come up a lot. Um, a little science to help us with our recommendations about what we should do with those immunosuppressive medications and vaccines. The article effect of a two-week interruption in methotrexate treatment versus continued treatment on COVID-19 booster vaccine immunity in adults with inflammatory conditions. The V-Room study, a randomized open-label superiority trial was published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine. A two-week interruption of methotrexate treatment immediately after um, COVID-19 uh, vaccination with a booster resulted in any sustained increase of more than a two-fold in antibody response. So that that sort of two-week thing we've been going with, we sort of picked it out of a hat. It, well, it made sense um, from what we understand about the immunology. So uh, go ahead, get that vaccine. Um, interrupt the methotrexate treatment for about two weeks, we're actually going to get a better antibody response here. Um, continue to uh, remind everyone of Evusheld. Um, you know, the Evusheld folks, uh, maybe they have to do a, a better um, PR, maybe a social media campaign, get the word <laughs> out. Um, but this is that other um, therapy, right? We talked about an, uh, almost an 85% reduction in even symptomatic infection in these high-risk individuals um, for about six months. And we're actually going to be getting to that six months pretty soon. So we're going to have to figure out, uh, do we give people uh, another another bit of a boost? Um, all right. Uh, Pax Lovit. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be talking a little bit uh, here about Pax Lovid. This is sort of in the news recently. I don't know if you heard about this, uh, Vincent, but Anthony Fauci, he got the COVID, mm -hmm. you know, and so he, you know, he, he's doing the right stuff, got his vaccines, got the Pax Lovid. He's, well, certainly over the age of 65, even over the age of 80. Um, even though he's a fit, active man, he was um, considered high risk and was started on the Pax Lovid. Um, did well. And then during that second week, he had what we've described, uh, the onset of symptoms that he said were worse <laughs> than the original first few days. And he, like Stephen Colbert, got another five days of Paxlovid. Is that in the EUA, Daniel? Uh, 
You know, it is a little bit weird. It is not in the EUA. <laughs> the FDA has very clearly said that there's no science to support that. Um, yeah. So we will uh, perhaps discuss that in a little more detail next time. Um, but it is curious, right? And I, I think it, you know, I mean, I don't want to criticize Anthony Fauci, but it does send a very confusing message out there. Yeah, for sure. And um, maybe that his symptoms would have subsided without the second course of Paxlovid, right? Yeah, yeah. And I and I think we've got to ask what was what was the goal of that second course of of Paxlovid. So right. uh, maybe there's more that we don't know about. But yeah, that's um, and we will we're going to talk next time, sort of you know tell people ahead of time about what is going on with um, with Paxlovid, what is going on with malnupiravir, what is going on with no therapy at all with regard to these symptoms during that second week, those symptoms or positive tests out to 30 days? And is this really Paxlovid rebound? Is this just COVID rebound? And what should we be doing about it? Okay. So number two, remdesivir, remember that outpatient IV therapy. And uh, Vince and I were actually on a call where we saw the data of those people who are getting treatment, only about 0.3% have access to this. And it's really unfortunate because this is no drug-drug interactions, no... Um, renal issues, um, 87% reduction in progression. It's just an operational challenge. So somehow this has got to be done in a capitalist society where someone can make money off giving people actually the appropriate therapy. And remember, this is the only therapy we have for those little kids down to 28 days of age. So Beptilovimab, still number three, and it's at number three because we just don't have the efficacy data to help guide us here. Um, and last and least, malnupiravir, only about a 30% reduction. All right. Um, I will just say when it comes to the early inflammatory phase, we are not, um, we're not seeing many um, sort of improvements here. We're still steroids, anticoagulation, uh, pulmonary support, maybe remdesivir if early, sometimes additional immune modulation. Um, avoid those um, unproven therapies. And uh, actually, I will say next week, we may have more to say about one of those unproven therapies. Um, I actually have an embargoed um, article that uh, I can't discuss quite yet, but uh, whet your appetites. Everyone who wants to send me some hate mail, you can start writing it now. You can imagine <laughs> what it will be on. Um, I'll write the long phase, uh, the tale of COVID. Um, you know, continuing to be a challenge. Um, we did talk last time about some encouraging um, data with regard to vaccination and Omicron, um, but this continues to be a huge challenge for millions of individuals. And I am going to close here with looking globally. Remember, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, thinking about the world actually plays a part in our discussions about what we're going to be doing with vaccines going forward. What's the narrative? What's the message? What's the science? Um, and right here, I want everyone to pause the recording, go to parasiteswithoutborders.com. You can actually go to microbe.tv as well if they want to donate there also. Um, really help us support what we do. But if you go to parasiteswithoutborders.com, um, this will be July when this drops. So for the rest of July, we'll be doing our... Um, our three month, this will be the last month of our three month fundraiser for Foundation International Medical Relief of Children. Um, so we're going to be doubling those donations uh, to get up to a potential donation of $40,000. And our fundraiser is really focused on our clinic in Baduta District of Eastern Uganda. Time for your questions for Daniel. You can send them to daniel at microbe.com. TV. Catherine writes, I'm a pediatrician in Waco, Texas, or Waco. I don't know I how it's to say Waco. It. Waco. <laughs> I think it's Waco. That was the Sorry. Slip, right? <laughs> <laughs> who has a patient who was diagnosed with severe MISC in October of 2021. He thankfully has had a full recovery and has been released to play sports by cardiology. His father's concerned because the entire family, including this 11-year-old, Came down with SARS-CoV-2 infection earlier this month. His case was mild, but that was true of the last episode, which resulted in MISC. Dad is wondering about the recurrent risk of MISC with repeat infections. Child's not vaccinated, although I have encouraged them to get him vaccinated for SARS-CoV-2 as soon as possible. We don't have the vaccine in our clinic, but the local health department does. That is a whole other concern, as we have asked to have vaccine in our clinic for over a year with no movement from the corporate hospital system to allow this. Very frustrating for my partners and me. Appreciate your help in this matter, as I have not been able to find any recurrence risk data for MISC. 
Yeah. So there's, I think there's two points here that are, well, three points I'm going to go. So one is that, um, you know, we are cl closely following individuals that had miss C. So this is this multi-system inflammatory syndrome of children. We also see it in adults. Um, <clears throat> the quote unquote risk is considered very low. We're really not seeing recurrent miss C. So that's, that's encouraging. Um, so the other, though, is what about, um, you know, this inflammatory syndrome post-vaccine? And I actually have reviewed a number of, um, you know, publications, um, you know, reports. When you really start looking through, it's very hard to find individuals who have this triggered by vaccine. Um, usually there's once you start digging through the case, you realize they actually had COVID. And so they may have gotten a vaccine and then they got, um, you know, SARS-CoV-2 infected, then developed um, issues later on. So it's very hard to see a vaccine induced MIS-C. I'm not going to say it doesn't happen. I'm not going to say at some point there might be some rare presentation. Um, but yeah, you, you really, these are individuals that we encourage uh, to be vaccinated um, because the MIS-C is really a phenomenon that is well described in association with SARS-CoV-2 infection with COVID-19. Um, but we're really searching hard and not seeing um, any sort of a significant signal in post-vaccine. Um, and then the third, this is how frustrating, right? Um, that there's such a challenge to getting vaccines. And this is one of those issues. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to, on the next uh, episode, start with a little bit like lessons learned. Here we are two, two years in, have we not learned? You really need to get the politicians and the large, you know, things out of the way. You know, if a pediatrician wants to order vaccines, they should be able to just go online. They should be able to call their office manager. They should get those vaccines in the clinic. We need to remove the barriers, right? Hard to get a vaccine. Um, yeah, we really need to uh, streamline access to vaccines. You don't, you don't need paperwork. You don't need bureaucracy. You don't need people standing between um, individuals and vaccines. Emily writes, thank you so much for continuing to produce this content. As a microbiology virology PhD candidate, many friends and family have been asking me for COVID medical advice that I'm, of course, not comfortable giving. I often say I'm not an MD and then recommend your TWIV episodes as an alternative. I share in your frustration with some providers being hesitant to prescribe Paxlovid and instead defaulting to antibiotics, which brings me to my question. A relative tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 and, per my advice, called his primary care to ask about Paxlovid. Instead, he was given a prescription for prednisone and azithromycin, along with a warning of the potential side effects of Paxlovid. What would you recommend a patient in this situation does other than not fill the prescription? I feel awful disagreeing with his primary care, but taking immunosuppressive steroids less than 24 hours post-positive test and subjecting yourself to those side effects seems questionable at best. I understand this is part of a larger informed consent and patient advocacy conversation, but you keep mentioning some suboptimal treatment plans that people are being subjected to. I think it would be useful if you touch on what a patient in this type of situation can do to advocate for themselves. Yeah. Um, so, the, you know, this is continues to be for me an, an incredible challenge is trying to basically um, spread the knowledge. Um, and so let, let's talk a little bit about um, th this physician, you know, as good intentioned, you know, hopefully as they are, is really giving bad advice. And so we, we've talked about this. We've talked about a couple of so studies. So one was the uh, steroid use in non-oxygen requiring COVID-19 patients, a systemic review and meta-analysis, where they showed that if you give steroids in that first week to patients who have, you know, mild disease, so that's that first week, oxygen stats greater than or equal to 94%, there was a six fold increase um, in progression to severe disease and hospitalization. There was a 35% mortality increase. Um, there was another study, and this was the association between pre-exposure to glucocorticoids and other immunosuppressive drugs with severe COVID-19 outcomes, um, clinical microbiology and infection. Here we saw when they got um, steroids, that was the greater than 20 milligrams per day of prednisolone or equivalent, the um, associated hospital admission odd ratio increased 2.5, cardiac events increased about double, pulmonary embolism risk tripled, uh, mortality was up about 3.5 fold due to COVID-19. So um, this is bad advice um, and it, it's tough, right? I mean, it's very hard and I know I spend a lot of time trying to keep up on the literature here. Um, 
But this is one of those knee-jerk reactions that I continue to um, educate against, let people know, this is bad advice. Um, this person would be better off not following the advice of this clinician. Um, and, you know, in situations like this, this is a sort of a, a barometer of the um, commitment to ongoing medical education of that provider, I hate to say. So if you get this sort of advice from your, your clinician, you probably need to switch. You probably need to find someone who is committed to keeping up with the literature and not recommending harmful interventions. So we had a number of emails about the interval of Pfizer vaccine, children under <laughs> five years, which you corrected previously. So well, thank you, thank you for <laughs> yeah, and, and that's I mean I'm sort of glad like I get this out here, and if I make a mistake, which I do make mistakes, um, hopefully not as many or as egregious as giving people steroids and antibiotics in the first week. Um, yeah, let let me know. I'm always uh, happy to take the the helpful criticism. And everyone was very civil about it, <laughs> saying you know we want to have the right information out there. So thank you. Thank and you. finally, our last one is from Carlos. Thank you for all of your help with all things COVID-19 related. I'm a general internist in the community, and I truly appreciate your expertise. My question is related to vaccination and pregnancy status. Does the recommendation for a fourth mRNA dose booster differ in pregnancy? Specifically, should a pregnant woman who has received three doses of mRNA vaccines receive a fourth dose at this time? I recognize a COVID infection in pregnancy can be considered higher risk, but I also don't typically think of pregnancy as a reason to obtain a fourth dose. And I just wanted to make sure I was thinking about this correctly. I look yeah. forward to next week's update. Stay safe. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carlos. Um, yes, yeah, so we, we've covered the science on this a few times. Um, and, you know, the, these are licensed vaccines. So we can start thinking through, start using, you know, science to, to judge us and making individual decision um, about our patients. So, you know, as we, as we've talked about, if a, uh, if a, if an individual who is pregnant gets vaccinated in that, let's say last month before they deliver, um, we do have some, um, you know, compelling evidence that that is going to provide protection for the newborn for the first six months of life until they're eligible to uh, get vaccinated themselves. So, um, that is a reasonable thing to consider. And I think as we've mentioned, um, Pregnant individuals are at higher risk of bad outcomes. They're at higher risk of ending up in the hospital. We discuss the uh, concerning mortality. We also discuss the increased risk of um, of losing that child. Um, we've also increased the discussed the increased risk of neurocognitive development issues should that woman get um, infected during that last month, um, that last trimester. So yeah, this is um, this is something where I think it's reasonable to have that discussion about. Um, possibly doing a fourth dose during that last uh, month before delivery. That's COVID-19 clinical update number 121 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, be safe. <laughs>